Hey y'all, um, so before we just get, before we get started, uh, I just wanted to say thank y'all for uh, coming and hanging out with us on your Saturday morning. Um, you can go ahead and edit. Um, but, uh, so this class is for y'all, uh, so feel free to come and go as you need, um, if you need to step out for any reason. Um, we're gonna go through a couple of different topics, um, talk about some things uh, regarding house plants, and then at the end we'll kind of open it up to question and answer. Um, again, this is for y'all, so I want to make sure that y'all are getting everything that you're like looking for out of it. Uh, and so with that, um, feel free to like ask any questions along the way. Um, and then at the end of the, uh, at the end of the class, we do have the $10 coupon. Um, Allie and I will be handing those out before y'all head out today. So, um, you can hit it. Okay. So this is going to be on House Plants 101. Um, House Plants are where I got my humble beginnings. Um, I started here as the um, the tropical buyer. Um, I'm the lead buyer here now. My name is Jacob. Uh, this is Allie. She's gonna be my assistant today. She is the floor manager. Um, so tropicals near and dear to my heart. Uh, one of my favorite things to like to talk about and so super excited to have this class today. Um, we're gonna be talking about uh, picking plants for the right location in your space. Um, light requirements, water uh, requirements, fertilization and pest control. Um, I would say these are like the core topics for, uh, for taking care of house plants. Like once you master these, um, pretty much any plant is gonna be a breeze afterwards. So first uh, we're looking at picking your plant. So um, for me, whenever I'm picking a plant for a space, I always wanna make sure that it's got the, light, light, uh, the right light. So um, there's a different, ki uh, different kinds of lighting options. There's gonna be low, medium, and bright light. Um, low light is probably the easiest to explain. Um, low light is gonna be a room that is bright enough to read a book with the lights off and the blinds open, uh, however they usually are. Um, but a low light room is gonna have the uh, like brightness, bright enough to like read a book uh, when the lights are off. Um, really bright light is gonna be really similar to what we've got uh, next to that window. So um, bright light is essentially as bright as the plant can take without having direct sun um, on the leaves. Um, and so anything in between that is kind of gonna be a medium, uh, medium light. But usually for low light, we like to recommend uh, snake plants, ZZs, uh, those tend to do really well. And then the ficus are gonna be a great example of a plant that needs really bright light, uh, the fiddle leaf eggs. Uh, they need really bright light uh, without any direct sun. And so once you kind of establish what kind of lighting you have in your space, you want to go into, um, the next question I'm usually compelled to ask myself is, uh, how much care am I willing to put into these plants? So for me, for me, gardening is, is a hobby. It's something that I want to enjoy and something that I, um, am doing for fun. And so before I get a plant that's gonna take too much maintenance and take too much brain space, I wanna make sure I'm like prepared to give it what it needs. So um, if you're like me and a underwaterer, um, I definitely like <laughs> definitely recommend like ZZs and snake plants again. Those are like for me, my staples inside. Uh, super low maintenance, low light, you can kind of just set them and forget them. Um, but you wanna take into consideration how often it's gonna need water. Um, how much light it's going to need and how much uh, what you're going to be able to provide it without causing any stress to yourself uh, and so I always like to go into that and then um, another big question for me is uh, pet friendly so um, if it's going to be a plant that pets are going to be around just want to make sure that I'm picking picking something non-toxic uh, or non-toxic or at least not accessible for the pets to get to so um, spider plants are a really good option, ferns, orchids, uh, those are all really great pet safe options that uh, can almost be put in any kind of lighting requirement. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? What's that? Or whoever goes first, it's like either way. Oh, a ZZ plant and a snake plant. Um, those are like my two favorites because they are really low water, great for low light. Um, I would say like 
I've gone like two or three months without watering a snake plant before. Um, I'm not saying to do that, but <laughs> do, as I, do as I say, not as I do. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, so those are all really great options for like some low, uh, low maintenance stuff. Um, you can hit it. Like I think it's gonna be three clicks. Three? Yeah. One more, four. There we go. So we're gonna jump into a little bit of lighting. Um, just, I really like this graphic a lot. Uh, I think it does a really good job explaining like a room and the space. So um, imagine this is a west window. This is in the evening. You're kind of seeing all of this light come in. So medium to low is going to be across from the window without any of the direct rays, but still going to be bright enough to like read that book with the lights off. Uh, medium light is going to be in this middle era area, so it might get a little bit of brightness, but most of the day it's going to be pretty consistent. Uh, and then really bright light is just going to be adjacent to the window. So um, very similar to like uh, like what we've got um, with these windows. Sorry, I'm like referencing these windows today a lot, but um, that middle space between the two windows would be a really ideal like bright light uh, spot where uh, over here it's definitely going to be considered like low light. So if it's coming through at the end of the day, it's, I would say it just depends on where the plant is placed. So at the end of the day, the light kind of shines that direction in this room. And so if I were to have a plant between the two windows, it wouldn't actually get hit with any direct light. It would just be uh, going around. Um, and so I think it is uh, like just important to kind of watch where the sun's movements are throughout the day. It depends on what time of the day it is. Yeah. So like if it's, so evening sun is always gonna be much hotter, um, a little bit more intense. And so plants that are getting evening sun um, are going to really need that like intense light. So uh, cactus would be really great in like a west facing window because it's gonna be hit with really hot, warm sun most of the day. Um, a good way to know uh, if your plants are getting too much light is uh, if they are getting like brown spots on them, um, almost just like these, it, it looks like a sunburn on a plant. So essentially it's gonna burn and then almost get papery brown. Um, and you'll just notice these really uneven uh, spots where the, the sun was just a little bit too intense. Um, and so, uh, I think you can hit the next one. Does anyone have any questions so far? I'm not trying to like run, yeah, what's up? Sorry. So succulents are going to like really, really bright light, if not a little bit of direct sun. So succulents are one that I'm really comfortable having in a, like an east window where they're getting like pretty bright morning sun, but it's never too hot. Um, and so, yeah, succulents are really uh, gonna do best in that kind of situation. Um, my favorite window to use is a south window. A south window is gonna have really bright indirect light all day long. Um, and so that's usually where a lot of my plants hang out. Yes? So would medium light be like right around the six inch column table? Yeah, so I would say like if we broke it up by the table rows, this this like row of tables over here is definitely going to be like medium towards bright light. Um, the furthest left is definitely going to be the lowest light. Um, I would say like this space over in this side of the room is a really good example of like bright indirect. Uh, to medium light. It just depends on the time of the day. Um, yeah. Any other questions so far? Yes. You might get to this and you have to say because that like texture, like I noticed that my apartment here now runs more humid than it was in New York. So that's changed the tilt a couple of times. What is it? So um, I think we will get it. Well, this is a good time to like get into humidity, uh, especially with like looking at water and plants. So. Humidity, um, sta I, so some people get like very specific with their humidity with a lot of their plants. So there's some stuff like um, the anthuriums and some of the philodendrons really need like much more humidity in order to continue their growth pattern. Uh, and so with that, um, higher humidity is usually pretty good. Um, 
just out of curiosity, is there like any yellowing that you're noticing or like, how are they declining? Uh, it was like a fringe of curl, so it's just like dried up, shriveled, and Okay, so the Shriga Pearls is definitely not going to do well with the humidity. So like, um, I kind of like separate my plants into two like houses almost of like the ones that are really going to like a lot of humidity. Um, those are just kind of scattered throughout the house, getting the normal like humidity cycle throughout uh, the home. And then the cacti and succulents are going to be in a different like different space. I usually like to put the cacti and succulents in a drafty area. So they are able to dry out a little bit faster um, and have a little bit less humidity in their direct area. Any other questions so far? Yeah, for succulents, the bathroom is going to be um, almost the worst spot. Um, <laughs> a dark bathroom, I would say, is like, yeah. it's going to be tough. But yeah, it's going to be tough to get some plants to grow there. Um, but ferns? Ferns would do really well in that kind of situation. Uh, I do a lot of ferns in like restrooms and stuff like that. Um, they really like the humidity, but they also um, are really good at, at like tolerating low light. Um, and so like once you've identified the like lighting requirements and situational like environment uh, that's going to be affecting your plants, um, watering is kind of the next big topic to like take a look at. So. Watering, um, let me see, I'm like, I'm, you jump in, I'm like. Um, I mean, but hy hydrophobic soil, I feel like, is one of the biggest issues that you can face with mm -hmm. watering. Um, and you may think that you're watering your plant properly. Mm -hmm. um, but it's gonna go, say if you haven't watered it for quite a while, it's gonna go hydrophobic in the middle and that water in the middle is not gonna absorb. So it'll just take the water at the, at the very top and then it'll go down the side to the bottom so the roots aren't going to absorb any of that water. So usually um, to keep that from happening, a great way to water your plants is gonna be through bottom watering and soaking them. Um, so. Yeah, so that is like perfectly on the head. So um, hydrophobic soil uh, is probably like I would say one of the bigger issues with watering plants um, because it really does seem like whenever you pour the water in there, um, it seems like the water's coming out of the bottom, so everything must be thoroughly saturated. Um, what happens is whenever soil dries out too much, it begins to cling to itself instead of clinging to the water that we're like trying to give the plants. And so what happens is you notice the top and the bottom generally are going to look pretty wet, especially after watering, but that middle section is going to stay really dry. So if you're noticing a plant is um, kind of seeming like it's drying out, but you're watering frequently, the soil is likely going to be hydrophobic. But what I really like about this photo so much is it also shows the uh, intensity of the root system. So sometimes a heavy root system is going to prevent a plant from absorbing water as well. And so, I'm a very tactile person. Um, I've always been told that our best gardening tool is our hands. And so I really like to just dig my fingers into the soil um, and just check and see what's going on there. So um, uh, for example, like a plant like this, I would just put my finger right in there and feel what's going on. Um, I really like moisture meters, but um, for me it was easier to learn just based off of like how it feels before uh, assigning like a metric, metric to it. Um, but, <laughs> Thoroughly watering your plants um, is going to look like uh, you'll want to water it and probably wait about 15 minutes and then water it again. So it's going to be a two cycle process. The first is like an initial wet just to make sure that your like soil is uh, like awake, doing its thing, ready to accept the water. The second watering is really going to make sure that you're saturating the soil and the plant is going to have all of the water that it needs to survive. And so um, with the two watering process, you've got like a couple of options. You, the, yes? When you say saturating, so does that mean that you put on so much water that the water is taking so long for it to go down? Yes, so, so, yes, more specifically, more specifically, a lot of people are concerned with um, overwatering. That's something that, like, even though I underwater my plants at home, 
it's something that I'm still concerned about because you, if you overdo it, it's like overdone and it's hard to come back from that. Um, however, what I always keep in mind is it is not about the amount of water, it's about the frequency of water. And so if I wanted to, I can pour a five gallon bucket of water on this soil, just making sure that it's thoroughly saturated. The plants only, so the soil is only able to hold a certain amount of water. And so I just wanna make sure that it's holding at its carrying capacity. And then anything that is uh, draining off afterwards is just excess. And so I usually stick to like a once every two weeks uh, like schedule on watering. Uh, it's really gonna depend, but I'd like to let the plants dry out about three inches from the top. So with these little six inch pots, it's usually about halfway down. I'll give it a good watering. Um, but I always like to make sure that the soil is holding as much water as it can, um, or else you kind of face this problem of it being hydrophobic and like uh, clinging to itself. Um, and to add to that, mm -hmm. if you are noticing that it's taking a while for the water to drain from mm -hmm. the pot, I would look into um, the drainage in your mm -hmm. pot just to make sure that you have enough drainage for the water to really be able to go through and the excess to be able to come out of the bottom of the pot. It shouldn't take too long for mm -hmm. it to fully drain. Yeah. Yeah. When you say start the drainage, do you mean like doing the roots or trees? No, like, like um, so like in these pots here, they are full of drainage. Like you've got holes all over. And a lot of the pots, like, a lot of the pots that I have that I have potted in their, you know, ceramic or terracotta pots, they just have one little mm -hmm. hole at the bottom. Sometimes they need maybe a couple, especially for like a succulent or something mm -hmm. that's really going to want to dry out. Um, I may even add another hole or two, or if it's something where the soil is pretty dense in there, I will want more drainage as well, just to make sure that I'm really getting that excess water able to drain out and not sit in the soil for mm -hmm. too long and then, um, you know, kind of affect the, the mm -hmm. roots and possibly cause some, some root rot. Yes. And so like, that's why I like to do the two cycles of watering of water first, because whenever you water that first time, you're going to notice the water's going to come out pretty quick because generally it's going to kind of be in this stage. Um, and so once I do that, I will pull back um, and come back 15 minutes or so later and do a thorough watering. However, I, that like brings up a really good point of um, like how to water your plants. So we've kind of talked about like quantity uh, over frequency, but um, depending on like what kind of pot your plant is in, you can either bottom water or top water. So whenever it is in this stage, I really like to jump uh, directly into bottom watering. Um, I'll fill up a sink or like a little dish or a tray and just set the plant, uh, the, the pot in that tray for a little bit, usually about 15, 20 minutes or so. That allows the soil to naturally pull up all the water that it can hold. So instead of watering over the top, it's really going to be um, pulling up exactly what it needs. And so, depending on the plant. what do you mean? The, the, whether it's bottom or top, depending on the plant, or just uh, it's going to depend on preference, I would say. So um, that's why I like to get my like hands in the soil because if it's something that's really dry, like say, I don't know if these are any; these are not great examples. But if it's something that's really dry, I usually jump straight to bottom watering just to make sure that it is pulling up all the water that it needs. Um, it's usually a pretty quick turnaround uh, if you're going that direction. Um, generally, if it's just uh, like any other plant, um, pretty consistent schedule, I'll do uh, top watering. And did you have a question? Yes. No, so I'm just scared that that center core is not. Here. I, I, I totally understand. So what I would do is, um, it just depends on where my like fertilizing cycle is at. Okay. But what I usually like to do, um, especially if I'm fertilizing, is I'll bottom water a okay. uh, plant that's really dried out, and then I will come back and fertilize over the top after I've watered it. Okay. So it's a lot of water at once but that's also gonna prevent me from having to do it um, as frequently. Okay. So it's usually about like two weeks or so. Cool. Um, 
but yeah, I would say reach your hand in there if you feel like it's dry. Um, plants' roots are much more tough than we give the, or like tougher than we give them credit to be. Um, and so sticking your finger in the soil like this is uh, just gonna kind of stimulate things, get things moving, liven them up. Um, yeah, anyone have any other questions so far? Yes. So are you saying that after soil has gone, because of something, you can kind of dig it back? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, it just takes a heavy soak. Um, it is generally gonna act like a sponge, especially if you set it in the water. But if you're watering over the top, because it compacts on itself, it just goes right around it. Um, but with watering, we also wanna look at uh, making sure that our plants are getting enough, not too much. Um, and so let me move this out of the way. I think we can see a little better. But um, these are kind of the stages of something that's gonna look overwatered, underwatered, and then just right. Um, with an overwatered plant, you're gonna notice the, uh, a bit of drooping. Um, you're gonna notice the tips are gonna be browning and often um, perspiring. So you might see drip like uh, water droplets on the end of the leaf kind of like uh, falling off of there just if it's gotten too much. Yes. Going back a little bit to the water, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, uh, from the top, mm -hmm. can I put it like, I sometimes put it under the sink a little bit. So the leaves are getting all overwatered. Is there a problem with plants getting it? There's only a problem if the water stays on the leaf for an extended amount of time. So uh, when the water is on the leaf, it is going to um, almost weaken the plant's like immune system and allow space for like bacterial issues with the plant. And so you might notice like some spotting, um, some like browning and stuff like that. Uh, so I would say if it works, I would keep doing it. But if you notice that the leaves are starting to um, look like look a little unhealthy. Um, I would trim those off and uh, try to prevent it. You mentioned the current, like the mildew. Yes. Those, those are usually so. Those are usually pretty good with getting water on the leaves. Um, I would say, like, so in nature, they're in pretty rainy like environments, pretty super high humidity and stuff like that. Um, the difference is in their natural habitat, they're also getting a lot of natural airflow. So as high as the humidity is and as much as the rain is, they're also almost getting it blown off like pretty frequently. And so um, I always just like to practice caution. Um, if I notice the leaves are not doing great, then I'll kind of pull back and make sure uh, to protect them a bit. Um, and so that's also going to kind of look uh, like the underwater or the overwatering is uh, kind of that similar like browning. Um, you might notice the plant is going to be drooping a little bit. If a plant is overwatered, the best bet is going to be pulling it out and trying to repot it into some fresh soil, um, letting it dry out a bit. Um, usually the plants are able to bounce back from that uh, pretty easily, but um, catching it early is the key. And so that's why I really like to uh, like look at this graphic because this plant would is technically savable, I would say. So um, you've just got to catch it early enough uh, before it progresses into like root rot. Um, and then an underwatered plant is going to um, look very sad. Uh, they kind of just want to droop. Uh, it's almost like they're deflating. Usually when they've been underwatered, that's another uh, a pretty easy one to get back um, and like revive it. Uh, but I would say if it is to this point and you're noticing that it is drooping significantly and is showing signs of underwatering, that's when I kind of jump back to the soil might be hydrophobic. Let me go ahead and just soak it, see if it'll bring back. And usually like plants like a peace lily, you'll really see like perk back up too after like um, giving them more, more water. How do you diagnose something that's overwatered versus underwatered? Like, how do you know you're starting to show signs of Ooh, okay. So um, allow me to geek out a little bit. Um, root rot is, was a very fine line between root, root rot and overwatering. Overwatering, you're gonna notice like a bit more yellowing, um, where root rot is going to almost seem like someone cut all of the roots off of the plant. And so um, if it's overwatered, there is a chance that it is going to have root rot. And so what I like to do is like at that time repot, and whenever I do repot, I always check the roots, um, check and see if there's anything black or squishy. Um, roots do this weird thing called root sloughing, or I think they just call it sloughing, but essentially the outer like flesh of the root 
pulls off of like the thin fibrous root on the inside. Uh, and so that is like a tell tail sign of uh, root rot is when those roots start to um, like almost fall apart on themselves. And so usually when it is overwatered, pulling it out, checking the roots is always like a pretty good idea to, to course correct. Um, if yeah, so I'll pull it out and um, I'll just kind of shake, uh, shake it up, but I usually like to just scratch around the root ball itself and get the roots going out and down. And once they're kind of out and down, the um, more rotten stuff generally makes itself pretty pre prevalent. Like you'll, you'll really notice. Uh, it will also smell. Yeah. You'll, you'll be able to tell. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to cut the overwatered parts off? Yeah, so um, I cut the rotted part off, but I usually cut like an extra half inch or so. Um, half inch to one inch back towards the plant. Um, that's going to remove any rot and try to remove anything that is going to uh, further like rot the plant. Any other questions before we start looking at some other? Yes. For the bottom watering, mm -hmm. how long do you usually take it for? Usually 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Um, personally, I really like to do it with like terracotta pots. Um, I feel like succulents, too, especially, do really well when you're bottom watering because they really don't like to have that water directly on their, um, like, succulent leaves. Um, bottom. How much water? Um, so, good rule of thumb is I usually like to do, like, an inch or so above the bottom of the pot line. Um, but theoretically, like, you could do, like, a whole five-gallon bucket, like, fill the whole five-gallon bucket and just let it soak for a little bit. Um, but... <laughs> About an inch is probably going to be your best bet. <laughs> and if you would have to leave it soaking for more than 15, 20 yep. minutes, it will also be okay. I have plants that I've left outside soaking for, mm -hmm. you know, all day or overnight. And, you know, probably not ideal, but they're fine. Yep. And sometimes I just do it and be like, it's just going to go to I'm soaking in the morning, yep. I go to work, and then I come home. Mm -hmm. and Or you're gonna the next one, I think. There we go. Okay, so this is a part that I also kind of like to nerd out about um, fertilizing your plants. Um, I always like to, I feed pretty heavy. Um, what I like to really do is um, I feed almost every week, but I will do a half feed where, um, for example, this is gonna be an ounce to a gallon. I'll do a half ounce to a gallon once a week instead of an ounce to a gallon every other week. Um, the reason I like to feed a little bit more consistently is it's providing the nutrients for the plant as it's needing to grow. So you're not uh, shocking the plant every two weeks with a uh, influx of nutrients. Uh, you're giving it a consistent meal weekly. Um, and so I really like to use organic fertilizers. Um, I know um, the numbers seem lower uh, but we'll kind of like talk about like that as well. But I really like the organic fertilizers. Um, the three numbers that you're seeing here, the 846, that's going to be the nitrogen, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium ratio. Um, with tropical plants, you always really want to focus on having a little bit of a higher nitrogen. So the nitrogen is what's going to push new leaves. And so um, let's see, I think I've got a good example up here. So the 624 is a pretty good example of that. That is a general all-purpose fertilizer, but it's going to focus with that higher number, um, focus on like leaves and foliage. The middle number, the phosphorus, is going to um, do two things. If it's an outdoor plant that's going to be blooming, it is going to push blooms. It's going to make sure that the plant has all of the resources that it needs to flower. Um, if it's an indoor plant, though, phosphorus actually um, boosts the plant's immune system and so you're going to notice that it's going to keep the plant naturally uh, more healthy um, and then the last number the potassium is going to affect the roots so a good way to look at it is the first number is the leaves the middle number is the health and then the last number is going to be the um, the roots and so if you've got a healthy root system balanced with um, feeding the foliage you're going to have overall a really happy plant 
And so the 846 is usually a pretty good option that I like to use. Uh, it is granular. And so what I do is I just grab a handful of it and throw it on my plants um, once, uh, once a month or so. Um, some other options though, uh, some liquids. I really like to use um, liquid seaweed. It's not necessarily going to fertilize the plants, but liquid seaweed acts as a um, essentially like a daily vitamin. Uh, it's gonna give the plant the micronutrients that it needs. Um, it's also gonna reduce stress. Uh, and generally when you're feeding liquid seaweed, the leaves are coming out a little bit healthier uh, and a little, uh, a little bit more green. Um, it's gonna help like the reduce stress on like the root system and everything like that. Uh, yes. So I usually, I usually do it once a month. Like if I'm not feeding consistently like each week, I'm gonna just do once a month. I kind of like, depending on the plant, I would say, I like to generally have everything on like the same schedule, but right now I'm kind of all over the place with my plants. Uh, and so best case scenario, what I would be doing is mixing an ounce of the liquid seaweed with a gallon of water, but I would also add an ounce of the, um, what's a good one? The liquid, uh, the biomatrix, because it's got like a higher um, nitrogen count as well. So I would do an ounce of each into one gallon of water, and I would do, use that mix once a month. Um, that's gonna be a good starting place for like fertilizing plants, uh, especially like if it's a, an established plant. Um, So um, liquids are generally going to be taken up by the plant faster. So with the granular, it is going to be a bit of a waiting game, but once it kicks in, you notice it's really kicking in. So um, I like to use this one on the, um, like a lot of the leafy anthuriums that I'll grow, um, or philodendrons, monsteras, and stuff like that, because uh, I put it on there once a month and just let it do its thing. Um, as it breaks down, it feeds the plant, so it's kind of that process of the um, consistent feeding cycle. Um, the liquids are just taken up a little bit easier, so um, repotting them and then liquid fertilizing is generally going to be the best bet, uh, just to make sure that they've gotten the nutrients that they need immediately without having to um, wait for the granular to break down. I usually like to put it on there, uh, and then I'll water afterwards. Um, I don't water like I don't water every time I put it on there but um, it's naturally gonna break down as, as you water. And so I'll usually just put it on there whenever I'm thinking about it, and then next watering cycle, whenever I go to water, it'll start the uh, breaking down process. Um, anyone have any other questions? So I, <laughs> okay, so this is gonna be like the every week fertilization. So I put it on once a month, but it's going to consistently feed weekly. So every time I water, the plant's going to be getting food. Once once every two weeks or so. It just depends on the plant. So like watering cycles are going to be really subjective on what the plant's needing. And so this is going to be the consistent feeding option where the biomatrix is going to be um, like if I were using liquids, I would cut the ratio in half and use it weekly, or use it at every watering instead of every other watering. It's a better way to put that, I would say. So liquids, right? Yeah, so I, I think I understand what you're saying. I, I think everybody kind of fertilizes their plants a little bit differently. For me, I use that the biomatrix a lot, and I will do it every other watering. I water my plants, probably every two weeks or so, mm -hmm. um, which, I mean, I'm sh maybe I should water them more. I just, that's just with the, um, the environment that my plants are in, that's what works for them. Um, I'll do every other watering. And I think what Jacob does is like cuts that in half of like, however much I put on my plants every two weeks, he does half that every watering mm -hmm. instead of every other watering. Whereas you can do that with the liquid, but then the granular 
is going to be um, you're not going to put the fertilizer on as much, but then every watering, it's going to give it that same type mm. of boost because it's going to help it um, release that nutrients a little bit more. Mm. I think that's what you're trying to do. Yes, that's a much better way than what I, how I was saying it. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and then, so like with fertilizing, um, I, I like to fertilize whatever I see new growth. So anytime I see a plant that's got, um, that's like a usually, when it's got new growth, it's a good indicator that the plant wants to grow. So I want to provide the food that it needs to grow. And so if I ever um, am like on a pause of fertilizing, say over winter, I won't fertilize as much. Come spring, I start seeing the new growth. I'm like, okay, time to start fertilizing, make sure that the plant has what it needs to grow. Um, and then this is a really great example of um, over fertilizing. So um, over fertilizing is going to look very similar to uh, sunburn. Um, the plant is going to turn yellow. Uh, it's going to have these like really brown papery spots. But the the key here is that it's going to start yellowing from the outside edges of the leaf and come inwards. Um, and you notice that like it's yellow around the edge, and then the brown uh, kind of like creeps in as well. And so the plant is going to become really dry and papery. Um, and that's just from too much fertilizer. Um, if it ever gets to this point, what I like to do is let it dry out and then thoroughly drench the soil or repot. Uh, just there has been, uh, when it gets to this point, usually it's a buildup of salts in the soil. Uh, and so you just want to flush those salts out or you want to replace the soil entirely. Uh, biomatrix, uh, microlife biomatrix, yeah. Um, it's going to be a really great uh, feed for tropicals especially, um, but I kind of use it on a, lo a lot of different plants. Um, that's the thing that I really like about the organics is you're not necessarily worried as much about fertilizer burn um, because it's not concentrated in these, uh, in the organic um, fertilizers. Ready? Yeah, sorry. I, I like to. Um, it's definitely an aesthetic choice, um, but I really like to cut off the over-fertilized leaves. Um, that way I can see if any of the new leaves are starting to decline as well. Like it allows me to kind of uh, create this like focus on the fresh leaves and make sure that I'm doing everything that I can to prevent it from uh, continuing to burn. That's the aim of sunburn? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, so what I'll do is I'll like cut it off um, and I'll try to move it into a spot that has uh, some like like less light um, or less direct light, I would say. Um, and then this is the this is the part of the class that is a little squeamish. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about pests. Um, these are all pretty common with houseplants. Um, you're going to see spider mites, mealybugs, aphids. Uh, a lot of times they just show up. Uh, it's not necessarily a, an indicator of like poor care. Um, they're kind of doing their biological duty of finding plants to eat, even though it's not cute uh, for us. It's like really not, <laughs> not great for houseplants, but uh, they are just bugs and they just uh, are trying to do their job. Um, this is the spider mites. Um, these are probably like my arch nemesis. Like they are um, pretty challenging, um, but what you'll notice is a little white stippling throughout the leaf um, and a little bit of like webbing over the, uh, the veining on the leaf. So if I ever notice a little bit of webbing on the plant, uh, specifically on the leaf, and then the white stippling, I will uh, immediately treat with um, Indol. Uh, that's usually my favorite. It's an organic, uh, but it is really, really effective at treating like spider mites, mealybugs, and aphids. Um, what I'll do is I will thoroughly spray the plant, top and bottom of the leaves, and then I'll do a spray around the soil as well. Make sure that I'm hitting every point of like organic material on the plant without putting it directly into the soil. Um, that's just going to coat all of the surfaces. So Indol works in a way of coating the surface so the, plant, the pests are not going to want to come back. But if they do come back, they're going to be um, kind of like disintegrated. Like the, the Indol just melts the hard shells of the, their, their body. Um, mealybugs are another one that are pretty common. Um, it's going to show itself as like these really white, like fuzzy, um, trilobite prehistoric looking vibes. Um, they're gross, 
<laughs> and nasty. Um, but no, they like will uh, really group up on the nooks and crannies of a plant. So mealybugs especially are going to be more so on like your cacti um, and succulents is where I generally see them. But I also see them a lot on like vining plants that uh, it's usually at the base, like towards the center of the pot. Mealybugs are um, one of the easier things to treat, I would say. Um, they seem intimidating, they look really gross, but um, the end all is a great option. Um, what I also like to do is take like a tablespoon of Dawn dish liquid, mix it with a gallon of water, and then I will spray my plants with that. That's gonna make a like pseudo insecticidal soap, um, but the insecticidal soap is particularly effective on mealybugs. What it does is it coats their nasty little bodies and prevents them uh, from living in, the, in a polite way. <laughs> um, they, they are gonna die. <laughs> um, and so um, mealybugs are not the end of the world. Um, these are all very treatable issues. Uh, they just are intimidating. <coughs> um, and then finally, we've got aphids. Um, aphids have such a unique role in, um, in the food chain. Um, <laughs> they like are not beneficial on houseplants or indoor tropicals or anything like that, but they kind of got a deal worked out with ants, um, they just like friends. Uh, and so aphids outside, while not ideal, are fulfilling a role. Aphids inside though are nasty and gross. And so what I usually like to do is, uh, again, with the end all. So I see any of these problems, I'm generally jumping to the end all just because I've got it on hand and it's a pretty easy treatment. Um, aphids, uh, interestingly enough, a, like a great way to get rid of them is before you treat, spray them with a water hose. They, uh, I usually like take my plants outside or in something like that and then I'll just like put on the jet setting in a semi like gentle way, as gentle as I can jet a plant, I will just jet the, the aphids off. Um, but the aphids are gonna come in lots of different colors, orange, green, black, um, squishy little bodies that just need to be sprayed off the plant. Um, I, I think, I think um, yeah, so I did wanna mention the alocasias, uh, calatheas and palms are gonna be a little bit more pest prone. So anything that's got a leaf that feels a little bit more like sensitive or soft is going to be a target for uh, especially like spider mites. The mealybugs are going to like a little bit more structure and like cellulose in the plant that they're messing with. And so they're going to go for things that are a bit thicker and hardier feeling. And then aphids do not discriminate. They're going to get on anything that has new growth. So. Well, so that's a great question. The answer that I've got is not a great answer, but <laughs> um, I say more so an unfortunate answer. Spider mites um, are carried by the wind. So they're tiny enough that sometimes the wind will just blow in the right direction and spider mites are gonna appear. Um, especially inside though, I've noticed that if dust collects on the plant, spider mites are gonna be a little bit more prone um, to just establishing themselves on that, uh, that environment. Mealybugs, um, gross. <laughs> um, also kind of problematic though, because um, the male and the female mealybugs are gonna, like they look entirely different. So the male mealybug is actually gonna look more like a fly and will have like wings and fly around and everything like that. While the female ladybugs, or uh, the mealybugs are gonna be um, these little like almost scale like uh, insects. And so, those can really just pop up out of the soil. Um, the eggs are so tiny that it's really hard to see um, if they're there until they show up and start like reproducing in that way. Um, and then aphids, aphids just kind of appear. Um, it's kind of interesting. Like um, usually spring uh, and then back again in the fall. So like. Right now, what I'm noticing is a lot of aphids are starting to pop up, especially on like Hoyas. Um, I do notice that the aphids tend to get on pet safe plants more often than non pet safe plants. Uh, and I mentioned the Hoyas just because the aphids really like to eat the new growth on those. Um, 
And so they'll just kind of pop up, but um, if everyone is a little familiar with Austin, last year we had um, a really bad aphid problem. It was horrible. Like they were in all of the crepe myrtles. There was so much like sticky dew everywhere. Um, but that's just kind of what aphids do is they will uh, kind of come in cycles like that. So you usually notice them right before um, you, see, you start seeing a lot of ladybugs because the ladybugs will come through and just eat them up. Um, does anyone have any other questions on pets? Not as well. Um, I would say it works on the aphids pretty good. So it's going to work on the softer bodies where the spider mites are definitely going to have more of like a harder exoskeleton that's going to have to be like melted down. Um, it would work as a great preventative. And so if I notice any of these problems, I'm going to start treating the plant once a day for seven days, um, especially with stuff at home. It's going to get treated once a day, seven days, organics. Um, and then after that, I'm going to switch to once a week. So the reason I like to get like hit it once a day for seven days is to make sure I eradicate the problem. Um, and then switching to once a week is going to be more so a preventative, um, so I'm not going to have to deal with the issue again. And so if you've noticed, uh, or if you're at a point where you're not really having any pests, but it's kind of pest season, spring, summer, and then fall, um, I would just start doing a, a preventative spray. Um, just once a week on the plants or um, anytime you water incorporate it into that routine as well. So water and then just spray the leaves um, is like preventative. No. Uh, depending on, I guess, depending on what you're using. So with um, the Endol, it's not going to hurt the plant. Um, if you were to use neem oil, which is particularly effective at knocking all of these out, um, neem can be a little, um, can make the plant a little bit more sensitive to sun. And so I usually like to do it early in the morning or late in the evening whenever the sun is uh, down and there's no risk of the uh, plant getting like burnt in that way. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I usually, once a week, once a week at most, I would say, um, every other, uh, like every watering is good. So if you're watering once every two weeks, I would say that's a good like, uh, good routine to like incorporate. Mm -hmm. So I like to use it. Um, is, that's a tough one. So I would just be aware of spraying it on anything that's flowering. So like it's going to be a great treatment um, on just about everything, but uh, I don't treat like a big one for me is I don't treat milkweed and then um, I will try not to put it on any flowering things um, and then I will try to treat like uh, say like herbs and veggies after they've started producing fruit so after their flowers are gone and everything like that and I'm not worried about pollinators coming to interact with the uh, pesticide is kind of when I'll start that treatment um, but milkweed is usually going to have aphids on it um, it is just a almost like a symbiotic relationship between the aphids and the milkweed, um, but the um, ladybugs come in and swoop, scoop them up real quick. And I think milkweed also attracts a different type of aphid mm -hmm. that doesn't that only spreads to other milkweed. Yeah. So it's not something that you really need to worry about it spreading to other plants that you have outside. Mm -hmm. It's just going to stick to the milkweed mm -hmm. that it's on. Anyone have any other questions so far? Okay. Well, that is that is the lecture portion. Um, I know I just asked if anyone had any questions, but I'm gonna open it up to uh, question and answer. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, yes. It's gonna help with a little bit of humidity, especially if it's staying pretty moist. Um, I would say it's definitely going to be more so an aesthetic, uh, aesthetic choice. Um, but that's my thing with gardening is like, um, I'm doing it because I want it to be pretty. Uh, and so I like to use moss a lot. Um, it doesn't really harm the plant, doesn't necessarily help, um, but it, it looks good. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. 
so I have had like an issue with like a white, I don't know if it's like fungus or mold or something like that on the very top of like one or two, you know, like my plants that I've watched a lot of time. Um, what would that be? How would I really like treat that or get rid of that? Or just like pull off that top layer? Or is it, um, is it kind of fuzzy or is it like a... Okay, like mushroom, like, does it almost seem like, like mushroom texture? Possibly. Okay, so the reason I ask oh, is, okay. it sounds like, um, sounds like the soil is healthy. So, um, fungus growing in the soil is generally an indicator, uh, or an indication that your soil is really happy and healthy and alive. Um, Mushrooms and like fungus are really selective of what they're growing in and so if you've got uh, like fungus growing like that in the soil It's usually a good sign that you're um, on the right path um, I usually like to uh, just mix it up with a stick um, On top of the soil just like kind of mix it back in uh, plants have um, or soil more specifically uh, contains like a lot of mycorrhiza which are these uh, like little fungus that uh, kind of establish themselves in the soil, but there's like a um, symbiotic relationship between it and the plants because it's helping the soil kind of break down a little bit easier uh, while the plant uh, is not necessarily affected by it like it's only they're only benefiting each other okay. um, and so usually a good sign um, I would say if it is starting to spread to the plant that's when it could be an issue um, and I usually like to do neem oil okay. yeah. yeah you're welcome Honestly, the, the mix that you just mentioned is going to be the same thing as the uh, Coco Loco. Okay, cool. And so I would say that's going to be more so like a soil less blend. Um, still really effective. Uh, still going to need like the same watering and everything like that. Personal preference, I would say. So um, I would say that it's probably going to dry out a bit faster than what we've got up here. Um, usually with more organic material it is going to uh, hold a bit more water. And so if you're just using a mix that's really similar to the Coco Loco, it is gonna be drying a bit faster, but um, I would say it should be good just about any plants, um, especially like indoor potted plants. It's like a priority with potting or like potted plants is making sure that the soil is well draining. You just don't want it to compact on itself. So, yes. What about repotting? Um, I usually like to do it once or twice a year. Um, I usually repot early spring, and then possibly I'll repot um, just after the summer hits when uh, fall is starting to get a little cool. Um, with that, the bigger um, the bigger thing about uh, repotting plants in that way is you want to repot when you start to see the roots coming out of the bottom. Um, so if you've got like the drainage hole, just take a look they usually are going to start pushing roots out of the bottom and at that point I like to size up and so what I'll do is I'll go from a um, for example like a six inch into an eight inch pot so I always want to have at least two inches for the plant to grow into whenever I'm moving it, it moving it into something bigger um, some good indicators that it needs to be repotted uh, the biggest one is going to be the roots coming out of the bottom but uh, if you notice the plants growing growing really slow uh, or um, kind of coming out like a little um, like the leaves are coming out a little bit warped, uh, it might be time to like repot. It might just uh, need a little bit more space to grow. Cut it. <laughs> yeah, so what I would do is um, if the plant is too big, I cut it, propagate the pieces that I like, get rid of the old stock or like give it away, and then I'll have the new stock to grow um, into that like size that I'm looking for. So I usually like to take off about an inch all the way around. Um, so I'll just like scratch up the outsides, the bottom, but I only want to take about an inch off. That way the roots are still going out and down. Um, but with doing that, you have the, um, you're keeping a lot of the microbiome of the soil intact. 
so it's going to be less of a harsh transition um, because the plant essentially has its like gut biome in the soil with it whenever you transplant. So you don't want to remove all of that. Um, it can usually lead to shock if you do, but um, keeping it on there is going to prolong the life of the plant, I would say. So about an inch, you just want to make sure that the roots are not wrapped around or um, like going back into itself. All right, sweet. Yes. That's what I would recommend. Um, I will use like larger pottery as like a cash pot sometimes. So um, I've got a white pot at home that doesn't have a hole in it, but it's like a pretty ceramic pot. And so I'll just put a grow pot directly in it and not actually repot the plant into it. That way, whenever I do water, it's kind of uh, like in its own like self-contained like tray. No, I'd say that should be good. Okay. Yeah, the four hole should be fine. Um, as long as it is, I'm not super familiar with um, that part of the, the, the pottery process, but um, as long as it, um, I would say as long as it's got like one good drainage hole on it, it should be set. Yeah. All right, does anyone have any other questions? Yeah, um, plants are really good at telling you what they need, um, but they usually tell you when it's almost too late, um, which is the, the tricky game about gardening. So um, there are a couple of things to look for in general on all plants that are going to be a sign of stress. So a big one is uh, discoloration. So you're either going to see it turning yellow um, is most common. Uh, sometimes it can turn like a little like tinted purple, uh, tinted red, um, have like a little bit of stress color, but color on the leaf of the plant is going to be a good like indicator of the plant's health. And so if you're noticing that it's yellow, I would check um, first if it's overwatered, then I would check if it's underwatered, um, just get my hands in there, making sure that it's not hydrophobic. And then I would um, follow that up with just reviewing my fertilizing routine um, because the yellowing could be overwatering, underwatering, or too much fertilizer. Now, um, if I am noticing like a brown spot on a leaf, I'm gonna approach this a couple of different ways. The first one is how much light um, is the plant getting? Because if it's a brown spot and it's getting too much light, it could be a burn. Um, second thought is if it's getting the right amount of light is um, it could be a fungal or a bacterial issue. So with fungus and bacteria, You'll notice, um, specifically with bacteria, it'll be a brown spot with a yellow ring around it. Fungal is just going to be kind of splotchy yellow and brown. Um, generally, the fungal issues uh, come from overwatering, and so it's going to be a similar, uh, similar process there. But um, Plant Doctor is a really good um, product to treat that. Uh, we mentioned phosphorus earlier. Plant Doctor particularly has this compound that breaks down into phosphorus. So it treats the plant um, and then feeds the plant and boosts the immu immune system. Uh, so that is, that's kind of what I would look at uh, for like a brown spot is it's either sunburn, um, bacterial, or fungal. Um, if I'm noticing the plant is drooping, but like I just watered it and it's like still like saturated soil, that's usually a sign of root rot. Um, the plant can sometimes just droop before it starts to yellow. Um, good example of that is the soil would be really wet, but the leaves would feel really floppy. Um, it almost seems like the plant was underwatered, but the only reason you know it wasn't underwatered is because the, the soil is like still consistently moist. Um, and so I'm trying to think of any other big problems. 
or tricks that I usually go by. Um, I feel like those are the main ones. Those are like the, every plant that I ever get, I'm kind of just checking off those boxes like while I'm looking at it, just making sure that there's no fungal uh, issues, no bacterial issues. Um, aesthetically, you, generally speaking, a pretty plant is a healthy plant. And so it's more so about like each plant is going to uh, have different needs based off of what's going on. And so I would say like, it takes a little bit of trial, trial and error, um, but usually if you notice something going on with the leaves, there's a problem with the plant, um, and then that's when I would just like troubleshoot. And I hope that helps, like if that made any sense, yeah? So I, um, sometimes I'm a lazy gardener at home, and so most of my plants just get tap water. Um, but if I'm doing like a calathea or palm, um, or sometimes like the dracaenas, um, like the palm right here, definitely I would do uh, distilled water. Uh, the salt in the tap water can actually build up in the plant, and then you'll notice like the uh, browning leaves on the end, like the tips usually, uh, look like they're over fertilized and like have that burn look if they've gotten too much um, like natural salts in the tap water. Like yeah, so um, calatheas are probably the biggest, like most. I'm trying to find like an example, but all these leaves look fine, but like I've seen a calathea that's got like half of the mm -hmm. leaf is just like brown and it, it's because of the hard water. It's just mm -hmm. too, the mineral, it's too mineral, mineralized. It needs yeah. something a little bit more. Um, yeah, not as harsh on the plant. Yep. Can you help breaking down the I have a cold fiber soil too, mm -hmm. and I've noticed that it's too wet. So just what kind mm -hmm. of you just break it down and wipe it down? Yeah. Um what I like to do is wipe with a dry cloth or like a dry paper towel. Um, that's going to prevent uh, water getting into the leaf or anything like that, preventing bacterial issues. But just gently wiping it down is also going to help prevent pests. Um, overall uh, health of the plant is gonna be uh, improved. It's also gonna be able to photosynthesize better, so it's gonna be growing a bit faster. Um, I like to incorporate that too whenever I'm like watering, at least just looking at them and be like, hey, does this one need it? And so I'll kind of dust accordingly. And if you're doing like a preventative Meaning it can also kind of act as a good leaf sign. Mm -hmm. So that may be a good time as well to wipe those down with the neem. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's just going to give it a good layer of that neem and then trim the leaves when it's in this time. Mm -hmm. what, what do you do then for like, if you're like, if you want to like prevent dust, if you don't want to get like any extra dirt for doing that? That's tough. I. Uh, I generally don't have an issue with dust on cacti. I, I don't know why, um, especially the ones with the spikes. I think it protects the plant enough where we're not having that issue. Um, with succulents though, like the echeverias and string of pearls and stuff like that, um, I'm pretty comfortable just like dusting them off or like sometimes I'll just blow them. So, um, yeah, I would say that's fine. Uh, I, I use grow lights in my space. Um, I would just be cautious of how close they are to the light. Um, if you notice that it does seem like it's getting a little burnt, I'd probably pull it a little bit further away, but a, a little trial and error. Yeah, I would. Um, so what I would do is like have it as far away as like you'd like it and adjust the setting accordingly. Like if it needs to be like, if you want it close, turn the setting lower, you know? All right, well, um, thank you all so much for uh, coming out today. Um, we're going to be hanging around a bit if you all have got any other questions. Um, but don't forget to see us on uh, your way out for the $10 coupon. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah.